The Audiobook. Practice of Brahmacharya by Swami Sivananda Part 7. To marry or not to marry, is celibacy possible? It is quite possible for a man to practice celibacy while remaining in the world, albeit there are various sorts of temptations and distractions. Many have achieved this in times of yore. There are many even at the present moment also. A well-disciplined life, a sattvic and moderate diet, study of religious scriptures, satsanga, japa, dhyana, pranayama, daily introspection and enquiry, self-analysis and self-correction, satachara, practice of yama and niyama, physical, verbal and mental tapas in accordance with the teachings of the 17th chapter of the Gita all will pave a long way in the attainment of this end. People have an irregular, unrighteous, immoderate, irreligious, undisciplined life. Hence they suffer, and fail in the achievement of the goal of life. Just as the elephant throws sand on its own head, so also, they themselves bring difficulties and troubles on their own heads on account of their foolishness. Those who practice brahmacharya generally complain that they get mental fatigue owing to continence. This is only a deception of the mind. You get sometimes a pseudo-hunger, whereas, when you actually sit for dinner, you have no real good appetite and you do not take any food. So also, there is a false mental fatigue. If you observe brahmacharya, you will have immense mental strength. You will not be able to feel it always. You will manifest it when the occasion arises, in the same way as a wrestler manifests his physical strength in the arena, though he feels as normal man in ordinary times. Continence is not harmful. It conserves energy. It gives immense strength and peace. Sexual indulgence leads to moral and spiritual bankruptcy, premature death, and loss of faculties, talents and capacities. The practice of celibacy is not attended with any danger or any dire disease or undesirable result such as the various sorts of complex which are wrongly attributed to it by the Western psychologists. They have no practical knowledge of the subject on hand. They have got a wrong, ill-founded imagination that the ungratified sex energy assumes in disguise the various forms of complex such as the touch phobia. The complex is due to some other causes. It is a morbid state of mind due to excessive jealousy, hatred, anger, worry and depression brought about by various causes. On the contrary, even a little self-restraint or a little practice of continence is an ideal pick-me-up. It gives inner strength and peace of mind. It invigorates the mind and nerves. It helps to conserve physical and mental energy. It augments memory, will force and brain power. It bestows tremendous strength, vigor and vitality. It renovates the system or constitution, rebuilds the cells and tissues, energizes digestion and gives power to face the difficulties in the daily battle of life. The special virtues of endurance and bravery are intimately connected with the cultivation of chastity. A perfect celibate can move the world, can stop the ocean waves like Lord Jesus, can blow up mountains, can command nature in the five elements like Jnana Dev. There is nothing in the three worlds that cannot be achieved by him. All siddhis and riddhis, prosperity and success, roll under his feet. A foolish argument of the Epicureans. Some ignorant people say, it is not right to check passion. We must not go against nature. Why has God created young beautiful women? There must be some sense, in his creation. We should enjoy them and procreate as many as possible. We should keep up the progeny of the line. If all people become sannyasins, monks, and go to forests, what will become of this world? It will come to an end. If we check passion, we will get disease. We must get plenty of children. There is happiness in the house when we have abundant children. The happiness of married life cannot be described in words. It is the be-all and end-all of life. I do not like Vairagya, Tyaga, Sannyasa and Nivriti. This is their crude philosophy. They are the direct descendants of Charvaka and Vairachana. They are life members of the Epicurean school of thought. Gluttonism is their goal of life. They have a very large following. They are friends of Satan. Admirable is their philosophy. When they lose their property, wife and children, when they suffer from, an incurable disease, they will say, O oh God, free me from this horrible disease. Forgive me my sins. I am a great sinner. Passion should be checked at all costs. Not a single disease comes by checking passion. On the contrary, you will get immense power, joy and peace. There are also effective methods to control passion. One should reach Atman, the pure soul, 
which is beyond nature, by going against nature. Just as a fish swims upstream against the current in a river, so also, you will have to move against the worldly currents of evil forces. Then alone can you have self-realization. Passion is an evil force, and it should be checked if you want to enjoy undecaying atmix bliss. Sexual pleasure is no pleasure at all. It is a mental delusion. It is attended with dangers, pain, fear, exertion and disgust. If you know yoga or the science of Atman, the pure soul, you can very easily control the dire malady, which is passion. God wants you to enjoy the bliss of Atman, pure soul, which can be had by renouncing all these pleasures of this world. These beautiful women and wealth are the instruments of Maya, desire, to delude you and entrap you into her nets. If you wish to remain always as a worldly man with low thoughts, debasing desires, you can by all means do so. You are at perfect liberty. You can marry 350 wives and procreate as many children. Nobody can check you, but you will soon find that this world cannot give you the satisfaction you want, because all objects are conditioned in time, space and causation. There are death, disease, old age, cares, worries and anxieties, fear, loss, disappointment failure, abuse, heat, cold, snake bites, scorpion stings, earthquakes and accidents. You cannot at all find rest of mind even for a single second. As your mind is filled with passion and impurity, your understanding is clouded and your intellect is perverted now. You are not able to understand the illusory nature of the universe and the everlasting bliss of Atman, pure soul. Passion can be effectively checked. There are potent methods. After checking passion, you will enjoy real bliss from within from Atman, pure soul. All men cannot become monks. They have various ties and attachments. They are passionate and cannot, therefore, leave the world. They are pinned to their wives, children and property. Your proposition is wholly wrong. It is impossible. Have you ever heard in the annals of the world's history that this world became vacant as all men became monks? Then, why do you bring in this absurd proposition? This is an ingenious trick of your mind to support your foolish arguments and satanic philosophy, which has passion and sexual gratification as its important tenets. Do not talk like this in future. This exposes your foolishness and passionate nature. Do not bother yourself about this world. Mind your own business. God is all-powerful. Even if this world is completely evacuated when all people retire to the forests, God will immediately create crores of people by mere willing, within the twinkling of an eye. This is not your lookout. Find out methods to eradicate your passion. Marriage cannot be taken as an indispensable factor in everyone's life. Rather, a true aspirant should definitely keep himself far, far away from the fetters of a married life. For him, marriage constitutes a curse, while at the same time, for a man of a lustful disposition for whom it is extremely difficult to get over carnal passions, it is a sort of offense and a protecting vault to his moral recklessness. Marriage is, therefore, prescribed for those and it applies to the majority of mankind who are not yet ready for a life of absolute self-restraint and thus is to be regarded by them as a sacrament, and certainly not as a license to self-indulgence. Everyone born in this world need not necessarily marry. Marriage is meant to regulate one's life in the world. But for the institution of marriage in society, life would become irregular and beastly. But, where there is no passion in the heart, where the desire for God is strong, where there is a longing for spiritual pursuits, marriage is not compulsory. Such a man can lead a moral brahmachar's life. Parents should not force marriage on their sons. They should not stamp out the spiritual impressions of their children. Many young men in whom there is a spiritual awakening write to me in pitiable words, Dear Swamiji, Guruji, my heart throbs for higher spiritual things. I have no interest in worldly matters. The surroundings are not favorable. I am entangled in the meshes of marriage. My parents forced me, much against my will, to marry. I had to please my old parents. They threatened me in various ways. I now weep. What shall I do now? In many countries in the world. Young boys, who have no idea of this world in this life, are married when they are teenagers or about 18 years of age. We see children begetting children. There are child mothers. A boy of about 18 has three children. What a horrible state of affairs. Early marriages have wrought early loss of semen. There is physical and mental degeneration. 
there is no longevity. All are short-lived. Frequent childbearing destroys the health of women and brings in a host of other ailments. You have adopted various habits from the West in matters relating to dress and fashion. You have become a creature of vile imitation. They, in the West, do not marry unless they are able to maintain a family decently. They have got more self-restraint. They first secure a decent station in life, earn money, save something and then only think of marriage. If they have not got sufficient money, they remain bachelors throughout their lives. They do not want to bring forth beggars into this world just in the same manner as you do. He who has understood the magnitude of human suffering in this world will never dare to bring forth a single child from the womb of a woman. Nature of the love between husband and wife. The love between husband and wife is mainly physical, selfish and hypocritical. It is not constant. It is of an ephemeral and changing nature. It is carnal passion only. It is sexual appetite. It is tinged with lower emotions. It is of bestial nature. It is finite. But divine love is infinite, pure, all-pervading and everlasting. There is no question of divorce here. In reality, there is no internal union between husband and wife in the vast majority of cases. Savitri and Satyavan are very, very rare in these days. In Hinduism, Savitri and Satyavan are a legendary couple, known for their love and devotion to each other. As husbands and wives are externally united only for selfish ends, there is only some show of smile and external love. It is all mere show only. As there is no real union in their heart of hearts, there is always some kind of friction and rupture, wry faces and hot words, in every house. If the husband does not take his wife to the cinema, there will be fighting in the house. Can you call this real love? It is mercenary, commercial business. On account of lust, men have lost their integrity, independence and dignity. They have become the slaves of women. What a pitiable spectacle you see. The key is with the wife, and even for two dollar, the husband has to stretch his hands to her. Still he says, under delusion and intoxication of passion, I have a sweet, loving wife. She is really a real woman. She can be really worshipped. In mercenary love, there cannot be any real happiness between the two, the lover and the beloved. If the husband is in a dying condition, the wife takes the bank passbook and walks to her mother's house quietly. If the husband loses his job for some time, the wife shows wry faces, speaks harsh words and does not serve him properly with any love. This is selfish love. There is no real affection from the core of the heart. So there is always quarrel, fighting and disharmony in the house. Husbands and wives are not really united. They pull on anyhow, dragging a dreary, cheerless existence. Passion is not love at all. It is an animal instinct. It is carnal love. It is of a beastly nature. It is shifting. If the wife loses her beauty on account of some incurable malady, she gets divorced and the husband marries a second wife. This state of affairs is going on in the world. A husband loves his wife not for the sake of his wife, but for the sake of his own self. He is selfish. He expects sensual pleasure from her. If leprosy or smallpox destroys her beauty, his love for her ceases. When the wife dies, the husband is drowned in sorrow, not because of the loss of his loving partner in life, but because he cannot get sexual pleasure now. When your wife is young and beautiful, you admire her curly hair, rosy cheeks, fine nose, shining skin and silvery teeth. When she loses her beauty on account of some chronic incurable malady, she no longer holds any attraction for you. You marry a second wife. Had you loved your first wife with Atma Bhav, spirit sense, had you a comprehensive understanding that the self in you and in your wife was the same, your love for her would have been pure, unselfish, lasting, undecaying and unchanging. Just as you love old sugar candy or old rice the more, so also, you would love your wife more and more, even when she becomes old, as you have Atma Bhav, spirit sense, through wisdom. Wisdom only will intensify love and make it lasting. Physical love is animalism. Love of the body or skin is passion. It is passion exalted and refined. It is gross and sensual. Passion for the flesh or body is not pure or real love. It is only moha or infatuation born of ignorance. You do wicked deeds and kill your soul on account of this passion. Even our sisters of ill fame show for some time abundant love, sweet smile and honeyed words towards their customers. 
This they do as long as they can extract money. Can you call this love and real happiness? Just tell me frankly. There is cunningness, diplomacy, crookedness and hypocrisy here. There is no element of sacrifice in this love. To be a celibate? Or to be a householder? It is only for passionate people that the Grihastha ashram or householder's life is prescribed, because they cannot control their lust. If one is born with sufficient spiritual impressions, inborn vivaka, knowledge, and viragya, detachment. Like an old Sankara Brahmin, he will not enter the householder's life. He will at once take to moral brahmacharya and then embrace renouncement. The religious text also endorse this. Says the Jabala Upanishad, renounce the world on the very day you get viragya, the detachments. To some, marriage hinders the spiritual progress, to others, it helps. For Raja Bhartrahari, it was a hindrance, for Saint Tukaram, it was a help. Man reaches the same goal in the long run. Let the run be the shortest. Let the short cut be preferred to the long walk. That is what man always wants. A life of celibacy is a hundred times better than the life of a householder's life. I believe in celibacy, for it is the thing that unfolds the hidden power in man. Brahmacharya is the straight road to God realization. Marriage is a serpentine route. The former is more preferable than the latter, but man takes to the latter route on account of his lower passions. The realization of the self, however, is not denied even to a householder just because he has the burden of a family on his shoulders. Saint Tukaram was married twice and had children, yet, he reached Vaikantha in a Vimana or an aerial car. If your outlook on worldly life is simple, true and honest, if your would-be partner is one who is pious and one who will obey you in all matters, there is no harm in marrying. But if the married life is more likely to prove burden, a curse on one, why should one marry and entangle oneself in chains that can never be cut asunder? If you want to observe strict celibacy, do not marry. Do not allow yourself to be duped by saying, I will observe strict celibacy after marriage. Afterwards it will offer you its own arguments for giving up this vow of celibacy. Your dharma is to realize God. You had enough of sense and sex gratification in all your previous bodies of various animals. Animal life is meant for satisfaction of the lower appetites of sex and tongue, but human life is meant for a higher purpose. Why do you, O oh man, burn the sandalwood tree for serving the purpose of charcoal? This human life is very precious, envied even by the gods. One life lost means one golden opportunity to become god is lost. Sensual pleasure is tantalizing. As long as a person does not possess the object of desire, so long there is enchantment. After obtaining possession of the object, he finds that he is entangled in it. The bachelor thinks of his marriage day in and day out, but enjoyment does not, and cannot, bring satisfaction to him. Far from it, it only aggravates and intensifies the desire and makes the mind more restless through passion and craving. He realizes that he is in imprisonment. This is maaic jugglery. This world is full of temptations. You cannot get bliss in the objects of the world. It is only materialistic poison. Further, marriage is a lifelong imprisonment. It is the greatest bondage of the earth. The bachelor who was once free is the yoke and his hands and feet are chained. This is the experience of all married people, invariably as it were. Therefore, do not marry if you can help it. Escape will be difficult after marriage. Realize the glory of a life in the spiritual path and the great difficulties, anxieties, worries and troubles of a married life. Develop intense detachments. Assert your birthright of God consciousness. Art thou not Brahman itself in truth? A wife is a sharp knife to cut the life of the husband. If the gold necklace and Banaras silk clothing are not supplied, the wife frowns at the husband. The husband cannot get his food at the proper time. The wife lies down in bed under the false pretext of acute abdominal colic. You can see this spectacle in your own house and daily experience. Indeed I need not tell you much. Therefore, be wedded to harmony and have viragya, detachments, the worthy son, and vivaka, the magnanimous daughter and eat the delicious divine fruit of, self-wisdom, which can make you immortal. A wife is only a luxury. It is not an absolute necessity. Every householder is weeping after marriage. He says, my son is ailing from typhoid. My second daughter is to be married. I have debts to clear. 
My wife is worrying me to purchase a gold necklace. My eldest son-in-law died recently. Do not marry. Do not marry. Do not marry. Escape will be difficult after marriage. Marriage is the greatest bondage. Woman is a source of constant vexation and trouble. What did Buddha, Padanatu Swami, Bartrahari and Gopikhan do? Did they not live in peace and comfort without a woman? Lust is the greatest enemy on earth. It devours a man. A great deal of depression follows the sexual act. You have to exert a lot in earning money to please your wife and satisfy her wants and luxuries. You commit various sorts of sins in acquiring money. You mentally share her pains and sorrows and the pains and miseries of your children as well. You have to worry in a thousand and one ways in running the family. As two minds cannot agree, there will always be quarrels in the house. You have to unnecessarily multiply your wants and responsibilities. Your intellect gets spoiled. On account of heavy loss of the seminal fluid, you will suffer from diseases, depression, weakness and loss of vitality. Consequently, you will have an early death. Therefore, become an akanda, great, brahmachare or a lifelong celibate. Free yourself from all miseries, worries and troubles. In the presence of light, you cannot have darkness. In the presence of sensual pleasures, atmics, soul level, bliss cannot exist. Worldlings want sensual pleasures in atmics, soul level, bliss at the same time, in one and the same cup. This is an absolute impossibility. They cannot renounce worldly, sensual pleasures. They cannot have real viragia, detachment, in their heart of hearts. They will talk a lot. Worldly men imagine that they are happy because they get a few ginger biscuits, some money and woman. What more is wanted for them, poor creatures? More beggars are brought forth into the world through lust. All worldly pleasures appear as nectar in the beginning, but become virulent poison in the end. When one gets entangled in married life, he can hardly break the different ties of moha, desires. Therefore, give up clinging to this illusory life. Be fearless. Control the indriyas in the mind. You will develop viragya. You will be perfectly established in brahmacharya. The akanda, great, brahmachare. If you can remain as an akanda, great, brahmachare, an unbroken celibate, for a period of twelve years, you will realize God immediately without any further sadhana, practices. You will have achieved the goal of life. Mark the word, akanda, the great. Seminal energy as a potent sakti, power. Semen as Brahman, Almighty, itself. A brahmachare who has practiced unbroken celibacy for full twelve years will attain to the enlightenment state the moment he hears the Mahavakya, the great sayings, of the Upanishads the Hindu texts, because his mind will be extremely pure, strong and one-pointed. An Akanda, great, brahmachare, who, for a period of twelve years, has not allowed even a drop of semen to come out, will enter into samadhi without any effort. Prana and mind are under his perfect control. Bala Brahmacharya is a synonymous term for Akanda Brahmacharya. An Akanda, great, Brahmachare has strong Dharana Sakti power, to retain the breath for longer time period, Smriti Sakti, spiritual power, and Vichara Sakti power of grasping, retentive memory and power of enquiry. He need not practice Manyana and Nididhyasana, reflection and meditation. If he hears the Mahavakya even once, he will at once achieve self-realization. His intellect is pure, and his understanding is extremely clear. Akanda, great, Brahmacharans are very, very rare, but there are some. You also can become an Akanda, great, Brahmachare if you attempt in right earnest. You will have to be very careful of reaction. The Indriyas, senses, that are put under restraint for some months, or one or two years, become rebellious if you are not always vigilant and careful. They revolt and drag you out when opportunities arise. Some people who observe brahmacharya for one or two years become more passionate and waste the energy considerably in the end. Some become incorrigible moral wrecks also. Mere matted hair and application of ashes to the forehead and the body cannot make one an akanda, great, brahmachare. That brahmachare who has controlled the physical body and the physical indriyas, senses, but who constantly dwells on sexual thoughts, is a confirmed hypocrite. He should never be trusted. He may become a menace at any time. The dangers of promiscuous mixing. Do not be too familiar with anybody. Familiarity breeds contempt. Do not multiply friends. 
Do not court friendship with women. Do not also be very familiar with them. Familiarity with women will eventually end in your destruction. Never, never forget this point. Friends are your real foes. Do not mix with members of the opposite sex. Maya works through undercurrents so stealthily that you may not be aware of your actual downfall. The sexual vasana, lust desires, will assume an aggravated form suddenly without a moment's notice. You will commit adultery and then repent. Then your character and fame will vanish. Dishonor is more than death. There is no crime more heinous than this. There is no prayaschita, penance, for this. So beware. Be cautious. Bhagavan, God, Datatreya, Hindu God, has compared woman to a burning pit of fire and man to a pot of ghee. When the latter comes in contact with the former, it perishes. Therefore, abandon her. If you happen to live in a dharmashala, sanctuary, or public inn, if there is a single woman in your neighboring room, leave the place at once. You do not know what will happen. It is always advisable to leave the danger zone immediately however strong you may be through the practice of tapas and meditation. Do not expose yourself to temptation. Do not test your spiritual strength and purity when you are a beginner on the spiritual path. Do not rush into evil associations when you are a spiritual neophyte to show that you have the courage to face sin and impurity. It will be a serious mistake. You will be running into a grave danger. You will have a quick downfall. A small fire will be very easily extinguished by a heap of dust. You should remain far away from women in the beginning of your practices. After you are perfectly molded and well established in brahmacharya, you can test your strength by moving with ladies very cautiously for some time. If your mind is very pure then also, if there is no sex idea, if the mind ceases to act through the practice of uparati, sama and dhamma, remember that you have gained real spiritual strength and made considerable progress in your sadhana. You are safe now. You should not stop your sadhana, practice, thinking that you are a Jatendriya yogi. If you stop it, you will have a hopeless fall. Even advanced aspirants who have made great progress in yoga should be very careful. They should not freely mix with women. They should not foolishly imagine that they have become great adepts in yoga. A great saint of repute had a downfall. He freely mixed with women and made women disciples, whom he allowed to massage his legs. As the sex energy was not completely sublimated and turned into ojas, as lust was lurking in a subtle form in his mind, he became a victim to passion. He lost his reputation. The sexual desire was only suppressed in him, and when a suitable opportunity came, it again assumed a grave form. He had no strength or willpower to resist the temptation. Another great soul, who was regarded by his disciples as an avatar, became a yoga brashta. He also freely mixed with ladies and committed a serious lapse. He became a prey to lust. What a sad misfortune. Aspirants climb with great difficulty by the ladder of yoga and they are irrecoverably lost forever on account of their carelessness and spiritual pride. Havoc played by mental images. The presence of, or recollection of, a woman usually excites unholy ideas in the minds of recluses who have abandoned this world and devoted themselves to spiritual exercises and thus deprives them of the fruit of their austerity. It is very difficult to understand the presence of subtle lust in the minds of others, particularly in spiritual recluses, though the look, tone, gestures, gait and behavior may give a clue. Note carefully how Raja Bhartrahari had cried during his sadhana stage, Oh my lord! I left my wife, my territory. I live on leaves, fruits and roots. The earth is my sofa. The blue sky is my canopy. The quarters are my clothes. Yet, my passion has not left me. Such is the power of passion. Jerome writes to the virgin Eustachium about his struggle for abstinence in the power of lust. Oh, how many times when in the desert, in that vast solitude which, burnt by the heat of the sun, offers but a horrible dwelling to monks, I imagined I was among the delights of Rome. I was alone. My limbs were covered by a wretched sack and my skin was as black as the Ethiopians. Every day I wept and groaned, and if I was unwillingly overcome by sleep, my lean body lay on the bare earth. I say nothing of my food and drink, for in the desert, even invalids have no drink but cold water. Well, I who out of fear of hell had condemned myself to this prison, companion of scorpions and wild beasts, often seemed in imagination among a band of girls. 
My face was pale with fasting and my mind within my frigid body was burning with desire. The fire of lust would still flame up in a body that already seemed to be dead. Such is the power of lust. The mind is the seed of the world. It is the mind that creates this world. There is no world quite apart from the mind. The images of all objects are contained in the mind. The mind plays with these images when it cannot get the objects and does great havoc. If you constantly think of the image of the Lord, the images of objects will die by themselves. The forbidden fruit God's test for the spiritual aspirant. God places some temptations before the aspirant to test his spiritual strength. He gives him also strength to conquer the temptations. The strongest temptation in this world is lust. All the saints pass through temptations. Temptations are profitable. People are instructed and strengthened. Even Buddha was tested for his mental purity. He had to face temptations of every sort. He had to face Mara. It was only then, and not till then, that he had illumination under the Bodhi tree in Gaia. Satan tempted Jesus in a variety of ways. Passion is very powerful. Many aspirants fail in the tests. One has to be very careful. The aspirant will have to develop a very high standard of mental purity. Then alone he will be able to stand the test. God will place the aspirants in very unfavorable surroundings to test them. They will be tempted by young girls. Name and fame bring the householders in close contact with the aspirants. Women begin to worship them. They become their disciples. Gradually the aspirants get a nasty downfall. Instances are many. Aspirants should hide themselves and pass for quite ordinary people. They should not show their chamatkaras, excellent. Although Rishi Vishwamitra was practicing severe austerities, he was carried away by his turbulent senses when he came across the celestial nymph sent by Indra to disturb his tapas. If Vishwamitra and Parasara who were living on leaves, air and water were victims of lust, what should be the fate of worldly people who are living on rich food? If they can control their passion, the Vindhya mountain will float on the ocean, fire will burn downwards. The sex instinct is most powerful. The sex urge is formidable. It may conceal itself in underground compartments in the mind and assail you when you are not vigilant. It will attack you with redoubled force. Vishwamitra fell a victim of Manaka. Another great Rishi became a prey to Ramba. Jaimini got excited by false woman Masa. A powerful Rishi was excited by the sight of the mating of a fish. The householder aspirant carried away even his guru's wife. Many aspirants are not aware of this secret urge, a treacherous enemy. They think that they are quite safe and pure. When they are put to test, they become hopeless victims. Always remain alone, meditate and slay this urge. Money and woman shine more brightly than God for an ignorant, passionate man. Maya is powerful. Adam fell on account of one loose moment. Eve tempted on account of one desire. The forbidden fruit will ripen before the human eyes in no time. The post will look like the illustrious diva and make you bow in utter submission before it. Beware of maya, desire, and its meshes. The chains of gold can be cut asunder, but not the silken meshes of maya. A single unguarded moment is sufficient to capsize the whole casket of pearls, down into the dark abyss of passion and lust. The moss that is momentarily displaced in a tank resumes its original position in the twinkling of an eye. Similarly, maya, desire, envelops even the wise, if they are careless even for a minute. Therefore, sleepless vigilance is necessary in the spiritual path. The proverb goes, there is many a slip between the cup and the lip. Before you begin to eat the fruit of wisdom, the monkey maya will snatch it away from your hand. Even if you swallow it, it may get stuck to your throat. Therefore you will have to be ever vigilant and careful till you attain Bhuma or the highest realization. You should not stop your sadhana, practice, falsely thinking that you have reached the goal. He who lives in seclusion is more exposed to temptations and danger. He will have to be very careful and vigilant. The mind will be tempted to do anything as there is nobody to witness its evil action. All suppressed evil vritis will be waiting for an opportunity to attack him with redoubled force. He is just like a man who is put in a big bag with a tiger, a serpent and a bear. The enemy's anger, lust and greed will take you unawares. When you walk alone in the spiritual path, they will attack you like the thieves who attack a lonely passenger in the dense forest. Therefore, be always in the company of the wise. 
do not go astray.